Hello everyone, welcome to the next lecture for Geography 101. Today we're going to be talking all about the hydrosphere uh, and water around the planet. So what is the hydrosphere? The hydrosphere is the processes dictating the movement of water around the Earth. Uh, this includes all of the oceans, ice, uh, groundwater, lakes, rivers, water in the atmosphere, and plants and animals as well. So water is distributed all over the planet, uh, the vast majority of which is located in the oceans, or 97% of which is in the oceans. And then the remaining fresh water, 2.5% of all water on Earth is fresh. Um, most of it is frozen, so glaciers make up over 68% of the fresh water on Earth. And so only 0.4% of all fresh water is surface or atmospheric water. So there's not a lot of water um, out of all the water on the planet that's available as drinking water per se. So um, there are a lot of different processes within the hydrologic cycle. Um, and so uh, it's important to kind of look closer at these different processes in order to understand how water flows through this system. Um, we have processes that move water between the air um, and the surface of the earth, and those include precipitation, condensation, evaporation, uh, sublimation. That's uh, when a solid goes directly into a gas and transpiration, which is, um, as you can see here, um, the movement of water from plants directly into the atmosphere. We also have um, movement of water um, between the ground and the surface, such as infiltration, which is when water on the surface um, seeps into um, the ground as well as groundwater discharge when, um, such as in a spring, you have water that's from the, the ground, groundwater, um, that gets, uh, that flows out of that groundwater source, either into a river or a lake or, or into the ocean. Um, water also moves throughout um, the, the planet. Um, you can have surface runoff, such as in a river, um, you can have percolation, which is the movement of water within a groundwater source. Um, you can have glacial flow, so um, glaciers um, move just like water does, um, and we'll talk about that more. Um, you know, advection, so movement of water within the, the atmosphere, as well as ocean circulation, um, uh, so different ocean currents that move water around the planet as well as uptake. So um, plants uptake water into their roots and into their, their cells. So first we should talk about oceans. So oceans are the biggest component of the hydrologic cycle. Um, they cover 71% of the Earth's surface. So we can map uh, the ocean temperature as well, well as the ocean salinity. And we can see here, this is the ocean temperature um, with hotter water near the equator where it receives more solar radiation uh, and colder water near the poles as expected. You can also see here, um, remember when we talked about El Nino and La Nina events, that the uh, west coast of South America is significantly colder than the south or the east coast of South America, and that's because as you have normal or La Nina conditions, you have a lot of upwelling water that brings up cold water from the, the bottom of the ocean to the surface near South America. So that's why you have that cold region there. Uh, you'll also see here that the salinity of the Atlantic Ocean is significantly higher than the salinity of the Pacific Ocean, for example. Um, and that's because um, the warmer waters of the Atlantic allow for more evaporation, and that evaporation pulls out water and not the salt. And then um, the trade winds move that, uh, the, those clouds and that rain over into the Pacific Ocean. 
um, and it rains out. And so you have a uh, increased concentration of salt in the Atlantic, and that water is then moved into the Pacific, decreasing its, its salinity. The oceans are also very important um, for uh, carbon dioxide um, and reducing the amount of uh, carbon in our atmosphere. Oceans absorb a huge amount of carbon dioxide and they absorb about 25% of the uh, emissions that we put into the atmosphere. So our planet would be significantly warmer um, if uh, we didn't have um, the oceans absorbing this CO2. Uh, unfortunately though, that's um, the main culprit for ocean acidification. So as the ocean absorbs CO2, um, some of that CO2 reacts with water molecules and forms carbonic acid, H2CO3. Uh, and this carbonic acid can um, dissolve um, shells and deform them and make it very hard for um, shelled creatures to, to form um, those, those calcite coatings. Um, and so the more CO2 that's, um, that enters um, the ocean due to rising concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, the lower the pH of the ocean and the more of these um, free hydrogen atoms that uh, are available to dissolve um, these shells. And you can see here that um, this black line here is the concentration of CO2 um, in the ocean, and that tracks fairly well with the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And as a result of that increased concentration, the pH of the ocean has steadily decreased. Um, and that has a big effect on ocean life. Um, Corals, which are made up of, of calcite and aragonite, um, are definitely impacted, um, and you um, can't um, have as many shell-forming organisms, and they become very stressed. This is a map of uh, the aragonite saturation state, which is kind of a, a proxy for how stressed these organisms will be and how difficult it is for them uh, to make their shells. And under 380 parts per million, which is our, the CO2 concentration in the ocean in 2005, um, we had a large expanse of ocean water that was still in the marginal or, or uh, adequate range. But as we move into higher and higher CO2 concentrations, um, more coral reefs um, in these vulnerable areas um, get uh, higher and higher concentrations of CO2. And so um, by 2050, under a business as usual scenario, nearly all of the ocean is going to be in this um, extremely uh, difficult um, concentrations for these organisms. And uh, we'll likely see a lot of coral reefs dying off. You can see here already on north of uh, Australia and the Great Barrier Reef, we have widespread um, coral bleaching, which, which is when the, the organisms in, within the coral um, die off and can't survive. Uh, ocean acidification is greatest in the Atlantic, uh, and this is because the Atlantic tends to have the greatest amount of circulation compared to the, the other um, oceans. You have, have more overturning of water. And um, because of that, you have um, water that's been concentrated with CO2 from the atmosphere that's mixing with uh, that lower bottom water. And so um, you can move more of that CO2 down deeper into the ocean. And so um, you can see here that the change in pH um, over time is greatest in, in the Atlantic. And that concentration of anthropogenic CO2 is exceptionally high there as well. So um, let's talk about ocean currents. So ocean currents are really important for moving water and heat um, throughout the ocean. 
So um, you can see here the different um, eddy currents that are going on in the ocean and the, the movement of water along the coast. Uh, and so this is a, a really important process within the hydrologic cycle. So um, ocean currents kind of act as a conveyor belt um, and they move water throughout um, the ocean and they're kind of an in interconnected loop or ribbon um, of faster flowing water moving um, water from one area of the globe to, to the other. Um, and so the, um, this current is driven by density differences um, due to salinity and temperature. And I think the best way to, um, to learn about this is, is through this video that we'll watch now. The oceans are warmed from above by the sun. This results in stratification with warmer, less dense water sitting on top of cooler, denser water. If this was all that was going on, then no mixing would happen. But there is another factor that influences density of seawater, salinity. Ocean salinity, that is the concentration of salt in the water, is fairly constant over space and time, but small variations do occur due to patterns in evaporation and precipitation, which cause surface salinity to vary between regions of high and low rainfall. The zone of precipitation associated with the low pressure system around the equator causes lower salinities near the equator. Salinity then increases through the mid-latitudes due to evaporation where the lower portion of the Hadley cell moves dry air towards the equator. Salinity then decreases again towards the poles where there is an increase in precipitation associated with the low pressure region between the feral and polar cells. All else being equal, the saltier water gets, the denser it becomes. This means that both temperature and salinity need to be considered when looking at how water density changes over space and time. Due to warming from above, temperature causes stratification at low latitudes. The transition region between the top layer of warm water and cooler water below is called the thermocline. As we move poleward and the amount of solar energy reaching the surface of the earth goes down, the thermocline breaks down and temperature from top to bottom in the ocean evens out. Close to the poles, there is little or no temperature difference from surface to bottom. The evening out of density creates a situation where mixing from top to bottom is possible, but simple mixing is not sufficient to drive density-driven circulation, in which dense water sinks to the bottom near the poles and then flows equatorward under less dense water. In order to get density-driven circulation from high to low latitudes, changes in both temperature and salinity are required. The way this occurs near the poles on Earth is through the process of ice formation, because as salt water freezes to form ice, the ice crystals exclude the salt, increasing the salinity of the water left behind. So in regions near the poles where significant ice formation occurs, the exclusion of salt, which ends up in the surrounding water, leaves that water cold enough and salty enough to be denser than the surrounding water, allowing it to sink. This triggers a slow but important large-scale circulation cycle. This sinking of dense water triggered by ice formation only occurs in a few places on Earth, two in the North Atlantic and in one location near Antarctica in the Southern Ocean. The sinking water in the North Atlantic spreads southward below the surface water creating a mass of cold, dense, deep water referred to as the North Atlantic bottom water. The bottom water formed in the Southern Ocean spreads around the Southern Ocean and moves up into other large ocean basins. This Antarctic bottom water is the densest water in the oceans and fills the bottom of much of the Earth's oceans. But while denser than the North Atlantic bottom water, not as much of it is formed. So the bottom water formed in the North Atlantic moves all the way through the South Atlantic into the Southern Ocean and, along with Antarctic bottom water, fills the depths of all the Earth's oceans. The process by which this deep water slowly mixes with other water masses and eventually makes it to the surface is not well understood, but eventually in regions of upwelling and through slow mixing of different water masses, this deep water reaches the surface. Once at the surface, this water warms and slowly completes the cycle returning from the Indian and Pacific Oceans through the Southern Ocean into the Atlantic and back to the places where deep water is formed. This is a very slow process. It takes upwards of 1,000 years to complete the cycle. This process of dense, deep water formation in three locations drives a slow, steady movement of warm surface water towards the poles, transporting heat in the process. This is called thermohaline circulation. It is also referred to as the ocean conveyor belt, and it is responsible for moving significant amounts of heat from the equator towards the poles. 
All right, hopefully that got you to realize just how important uh, the polar regions are for ocean circulation. Um, the ocean currents bring a lot of heat from the equator to the higher latitudes. Um, and without the ice for formation um, in the poles, you don't have that movement of heat. So that's one of the kind of long-term worries about climate change is if we don't have as much ice forming then ocean circulations could um, decrease in intensity and bring less heat um, to areas such as uh, Europe. The oceans are warm. Um, so one um, important part of that ocean conveyor belt that's really relevant for um, us here near the Atlantic Ocean is the Gulf Stream. Gulf Stream is some of the fastest currents um, on the planet. Um, and it brings a lot of very warm water from the Caribbean up into um, the, the uh, North Atlantic in Europe. Um, and that's the reason why we have um, temperatures in England that uh, are significantly warmer than their counterparts at equal latitudes in um, Alaska. And so um, this is really important for um, our everyday lives and, and how um, our, the climate is different throughout the world. Another important aspect of ocean currents is the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. So the Antarctic Ocean is the uh, only place on Earth in which you have a complete circle of ocean water um, continuous around a, a line of latitude. And because of that, you can have very strong currents that develop um, that circulate around Antarctica. Uh, and not only is this important for the formation of Antarctic deep water that we just learned about, um, but it's also important for um, kind of blocking large scale circulation events um, in the ocean and the atmosphere from reaching Antarctica. Um, and it kind of blocks out weather patterns. And so as a result, Antarctica um, is kind of isolated in terms of its weather um, and uh, can be significantly cool cooler because of this circulation pattern. All right, so next let's talk about tides. So tides are also a big component of the hydrologic cycle and tides are caused by the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon, um, the change of sea level because of that gravitational pull. Um, this is one of the uh, areas with some of the greatest um, tidal water level changes and people walking around um, during low tide. So uh, there's two uh, main types of tides. Um, so there's spring tides, which are the largest um, tides of the monthly tidal variation. And they occur when the earth, the moon, and the sun are in line with each other. So um, when they're in line, these tidal bulges caused by the, the moon line up with the, the tidal bulges caused by the sun, and they amplify each other. Whereas during neap tides, the sun, the earth, and the moon form a right angle perpendicular to each other. And these bulges cancel each other out. And so you have the lowest tides of the month during neap tides. Um, tides, as you probably know, vary um, throughout the day. Um, as you have the um, earth rotating around its axis, um, that uh, bulge caused by the moon um, varies uh, and rotates around the earth as well. Um, and so um, each day you normally have both a uh, high tide and a low tide. And that period of time when the water level is rising, we call that a flood tide. The period of time when the water level is flowing, we call an ebb tide. Uh, and you can see here, this is a tide chart. Um, and for example, in this location, um, you have a low tide at 6 a.m. and then a high tide at 12 p.m. 
Um, tides usually are about six hours apart. Um, and so um, during the low tide, um, the speed of the water moving into an area um, is dependent on the slope of this, this tide curve. And so um, as you move from low tide to high tide, that water level is rising. So this um, time period is called a flood tide, whereas this time period after the high tide and going down to another low tide is an ebb flow. And the um, because the tidal current is fairly um, slow right at high tide as well as low tide, we call that slack current because there's um, very little movement until it speeds up um, and the tide changes to the other um, higher low tide. Um, tides can um, be stronger or weaker um, depending on the geography um, and the topography in which they occur. Um, one reason why you might have a particularly strong um, tidal level fluctuation is because of uh, geographic funneling. So if you have a bay that's shaped like a funnel, um, then a large amount of water is going to be pushed into that small area. And so you have um, very large change in the height of the water. Um, additionally, you can have what's called um, resonant satiating, um, and that's um, when you have the, um, it's called harmonic resonance. Um, for example, if you were to um, slosh in a bathtub, there's a specific frequency in which um, if you move in that, that frequency, the waves are going to get larger and larger in that bathtub. Um, the same thing happens in a bay. If the um, tidal frequency is uh, matches with the geometry frequency for that area, you can have sloshing just like you do in a bathtub. Um, and it just, uh, it, the, if the geometry matches up, that can cause the tidal variability to be significantly larger. And you can have areas with up to 10 meters of, of tidal um, elevation change. All right, um, so let's take a break and um, we'll follow up in the next video.